Coming up on today's episode of the Salesman Podcast. You read that uh, something is a really good idea. So say a uh, thought in your email, right? Like ask you, put, put the title of thought in email. And the truth that, so it starts working, but then people get used to it and, and, they, and they recognize that spam, right? So we, we, we pattern recognize. And, and then you now that thing that used to work is now uh, recognizable spam and you delete it. So, so it, all these techniques have a short uh, lifespan, you know. You know, at the end of a sales call, you say, uh, put it in your own words. In your own words, uh, what, what is it that you see in, 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 sure. in my product that can help you? And by phrasing in their own words, they convince themselves. Or at least they make it clear why they should do it and they feel more committed. Hello, Sales Nation. My name is Will Byron, and I'm the host of the Salesman Podcast, the world's most downloaded B2B sales show. On today's episode, we have the legend that is Nicholas Vanderberg. He's the CEO over at ChiliPiper.com. And on today's episode, we're getting into how you can reduce the time from when a buyer puts up their hand and says, hey, I, I need help. I have a problem. To when you I, the salesperson, gets on the phone or a meeting with them and then solves these issues and gets deals done. Everything that we talk about in this episode is available in the show notes over at salesman.org. And with that, let's jump right into it. So we're going to dive into a topic today, which I think is going to become increasingly important as, as buyers are working from home, sellers are working from home. And this is the, the speed from interaction to a salesperson engaging with a potential customer. But before we get into the hows and the, the whys of all of this, is there any data that shows that we should be focusing on the speed from a customer picking up their hand to a buyer engaging with them? Is the data that shows that quicker reaction times actually leads to more sales being closed? Uh, very much so. There were uh, many surveys on uh, uh, the decline in conversion rates uh, based on the time it takes to get back to to uh, the buyer, and it's actually uh, very dramatic. So um, if you wait more than five minutes, you're going to drop your rates by 50%. And um, and then some companies wait even more than a day and, and uh, drop by 80%. So there were all these studies um, uh, relating the time. And then um, we at Chili Piper decided to uh, address this problem. So we got into a, another level of data. Um, let me explain. Um, it seemed that companies were aware of this problem. So they uh, trained their salespeople to react as, as fast as possible. And um, there was this uh, kind of a glass ceiling around 40%. So I remember when I called on the um, the chief revenue officer of Zoom Info, he said, Nicola, my inbound is doing great. I'm converting at 40%. And to which I say, you mean to tell me that 60 out of 100 people who asked for a meeting, 60 of them did not get one. Um, and the reason why it's, it, seems, it seems crazy to me, but the, the reason why people accepted it is because they compare that to the outbound when you reach call mm -hmm. call to somebody and you get 2%. So 40% seems a lot better than 2%. Uh, but still, it didn't seem quite right to me. So uh, at Chili Piper, we decided to build a, a solution that we call Instant Inbound. And what it is, is very simple. It's a JavaScript that in real time uh, is going to qualify the buyer and then connect it to a salesperson either by dialing or by retrieving the calendar so that you don't actually talk to the salesperson, but you have, you have a confirmation that you, you have a meeting uh, booked. And... Uh, and uh, when we did that, the company says, okay, I'm going to do an A-B test to see if instant is better than waiting, right? So it's like, what kind of data? I said, I said, I'd love to have that happen. Actually, that company is called Segment. It's, uh, they just got, by, mm -hmm. just got bought by Twilio for, I think, $3 billion. Um, and uh, it was meant to be a three-month test. And a month and a half into it, uh, the guy called me and says, listen, we're doubling our conversion rates. I want to stop the test and buy the product. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I don't, to, I don't want to continue losing all these leads on the on the B side of the test. I want to go the all A test. Of the test. So that that and finally now we have a lot of uh, of data like that. If you replace, so there's a decline with time, but if you replace no decline at all with instant, yeah. then you you're going to double your rates. And so if um, I, we're kind of plucking random numbers out here, but if we say forty percent would be accepted what could we get uh, an, a, a kind of meeting booking rate using a instant booking system like chili piper yeah no most of our customers are in the 80 percent conversion rate and we still 
trying hard to get these extra 20% mm -hmm. because you're still losing 20, 20 of these leads. There's no reason to, um, but, but that's, that's kind of where we see now the around 80, 82% is the best we've seen. Um, and so now we're doing all sorts of additional automation where I mentioned the auto dial. So we actually immediately dial the, the, the prospect um, and that works very well. Then we're trying to get, get back these 20% that get lost. So what we found is that, uh, so people submitted a form that the form said, uh, uh, talk to somebody or request a demo, right? So the action was clear. And then you, you'd wonder why they just disappear there when they've made this action. And, the truth is that the reasons why it disappears are still mysterious to me, but there are some actions that seem to to uh, mitigate them. And what we found is that uh, if you shortly after the submitted form and then went uh, uh, ghosting, you send them an email with a link to a calendar, um, that's going to perform poorly. But if you send them an email with suggested time, so you say, it looks like you were not able to book, but uh, there are these three slots that could work. Would you do that? It, it converts 11 times better. So you're going to get back about uh, more than half of those, this 20% in, in this second leg of, uh, of an action. It's been fascinating, this, this uh, experiment. The, the truth, I, I still don't understand why people who request a, a demo don't actually book it. Mm -hmm. And why, when you send them an email with proposed time, then they do it, uh, but it's how it works. It seems like there's a lot of friction to mentally, and there's probably cognitive biases and everything that goes along with this. There's a lot of friction for someone to put their hand up and say, okay, I'm committing to booking a demo. I'm going to, I'm going to do this for them to then have it all laid out in front of them and not to continue. There, there's there's gotta be something going on there, right? Yeah, no, that's right. That's right. Well, so, you know, as always in life, uh, you guys in England know where there are multiple shades of gray. So, <laughs> so you know, there are, there are those who are committed, they, they book, they, they submit the form, they book the demo, and those who just think, ah, maybe, and as, as they submit, they wonder, you know, and, and they, so they were, they were just unsure enough not to go all the way, but sure enough to, to submit. So that's what, what you want to put is uh, um, actions in place that um, help them go over that, that uh, step. Sure. Okay. So for someone who's not using any automation uh, whatsoever, Nicholas, someone who is, they, they have some real, and we have this on our site, a real dumb inbound lead form where it collects a bunch of data and then sends the salesperson an email twice a day. They check their email because they're busy doing all kinds of other stuff. And then they ring up. What is the, if you could only put one element of everything you just outlined in place to speed up that reaction time, what would it be? Well, I, I honestly see no, no reason why uh, people wouldn't use a, a solution like ours where um, you can just be at your desk and you, uh, a solution, we call it concierge, uh, it, it can pop up your calendar and the meeting is going to be booked. So you can just uh, be sleeping onto your desk. So, so automation is the answer then, right? Is, yeah, that, is that fair yeah, to yeah, say? Prospect, yes, prospect are going to book your meeting. It makes no sense not to do that. It's like, it would be like saying, uh, uh, should I have a you know, a, a computer or should I write on paper, right? <laughs> sure. And, and send by mail, yeah. So from, I mean, what does this look from the salesperson's perspective then? Are they, as you described, are they sat at the computer and they get a, a notification? Um, what what does it look like? Because most of the audience who listen to this right now are individual salespeople, right? So what's their experience? What would the world look like using a solution like this? Yeah, well, salespeople love us because, uh, so there, there are two typical deployments. Uh, um, Real time and uh, scheduling. So in in the real time, we dial the rep and then we dial the prospect. So uh, the experience is that you make sure you mark yourself as available, right? And we, as I mentioned, we qualify and we route. So if the meeting, if the prospect is in your territory or your account you're on, you, it's going to be routed to you. Mm -hmm. So the rep sits at his desk, makes sure, makes sure uh, he or she marks herself available, and then the phone rings, you press one, and you would in connection directly to, with the prospect. Um, this is typically done in high velocity sales, so B2 SMB, right? So for example, Square, the customer, and uh, when an SMB call to get a, a payment system, often it's because theirs broke and they need it fixed immediately. And if you don't answer immediately, then they'll go to the next one and get it by the next day. In the mid-market and enterprise, 
our customers more typically put a calendar because the purpose is most often a demo. A demo takes more time. You want to have time to prepare. So uh, then for the rep, the experience is very different. They get a notification, like you said. It says, hey, somebody booked a meeting with you tomorrow. It's it's Joe from Cisco, and Joe is... Uh, and we do all sorts of data, data augmentation. So we say, is, is Joe was uh, director of security uh, in the, you know, WebEx business unit at Cisco, and uh, your meeting is tomorrow at 11, your time, right? So that, that's the experience they get. So sometimes we have thank you notes from reps will say, this is amazing. My calendar gets booked. I don't do anything. Um, and um, and it's then up to them to focus and, and convert that uh, meeting into a, Close one, and it's all of this just for inbound leads. I'll, I'll give you a uh, kind of a scenario here. Of my background is in medical device sales, so surgeons could just call me, text me, and if I was available, they would get through. And then I'd try and call them back, and I would never get through to them because they're instantly unavailable. They'd step out of there no, to make a call, right. they step back in. So, is this applicable, or would this be applicable? You know, if we rejig the software. For someone like me, I'm selling to a surgeon. I want the surgeon to be able to book a call in my diary, even though he's perhaps not a new inbound lead, but he's a, an ongoing person I'm trying to uh, kind of spend more time with. Yeah, very much so. So as I mentioned, uh, there's a little secret. Um, it's a thing I call suggested times. So if that happens, if somebody calls and you call back and don't get in touch. And by the way, we have a lot of... Uh, B2 medical uh, companies as customer, uh, we have uh, Weave, for example, is a very successful company. They do exactly what I'm going to say. They, they send an email with suggested times, and the surgeon is going to get that email in the evening, and it's super easy, right? You, you see three times, you check that they're available, and you, you book a time. So that's the uh, other piece of the solution for the outbound piece, where, where you recharge somebody and say, hey, do you want a meeting? Um, by suggesting times, you not only make it easy for them, but you also show uh, respect. So you're actually proposing the time, but you understand. Uh, you're not saying, hey, book with me. You just say, hey, I'm proposing this time, but I understand it may not work, so here's a link for additional times and so on. And th that works very, very well. It's, uh, it's um, uh, an approach that uh, is both uh, effective and respectful, and it converts very well. Yeah, that makes all sense. Okay, so we are so we're, we'll continue this analogy. We're, we're going back and forth with the surgeon. What or does the conversion rate increasing from from kind of touch point to meeting booked? Does that then continue into the person actually showing up for the meeting? Because it seems like you're getting more and more uh, almost social proof or, or uh, kind of the, the multiple laws of influence that are forcing people to, once they've agreed to something and they said they're going to show up, that they're going to continue down that front? Or does it, because it's so easy just to book a meeting, that leads to less people actually showing up as a percentage on the, the back end of things? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so actually, uh, you remember when I mentioned um, that the uh, head of revenue operation that zoom info said that i'm not touching my inbound process i converted 40 percent uh he actually started using our application because he said i converted 40 percent but i have a, a no show rate of 35 percent so he had one in three uh, person no, no showing yeah so we decided to address that problem too and the simple uh, way to do that is send thoughtful emails along the process, so reminders, confirmation and reminders. Um, and there's a cadence that works best in different different situations, but uh, th there's a confirmation that you want to send to acknowledge and to um, reinforce the commitment. Then there's a pre-meeting that you want to send to remind of the agenda. So why they booked that meeting in the first place and why it's valuable. And then, so, Confirmation is upon booking. Uh, reminder is either the night before for the enterprise or two hours before for the SMB. So because the cycles are, have a different velocity. And then you want to do, a, we send ours five minutes before. We say, hey, I'm looking forward to see you in five minutes. Um, you sent me an email five minutes before, right? So and for the good reason. It's the most convenient time. I'm, I'm about, I'm thinking, okay, I have this meeting. Uh, or I forgot, oh, 
I have this meeting. Here's an easy way. And the reminder, five, five or two minutes before, include the link to the meeting. So if it's a Zoom call, a Skype call, the, the link in there. So it, it's not only reminding, it's making it super convenient. So it's a typically three, three touch. Uh, you can have more touches, but the, the three have, we found work, works very, very well. Uh, each touch is customized for not only each prospect, but each company. And um, that we, we, the, we, the 35 went not to 10 percent when we did that uh, experiment. So still, as I always say, 10 percent is still <laughs> not perfect, but it's much better than, than the 35. Sure. Well, you'll get down to some number at some point, and that is just people being ill or the internet being down, right? There's always going to be a few people no showing. Well, that's amazing. So, yeah, Well, especially uh, if you're if you selling to children, they may have some other priorities. Of course, yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> and, and that's what I found. I'd, you, you'd, ring, you'd ring up and you'd get a nurse holding the phone like, across the room to the surgeon, side of the surgeon's head and someone's just come in, a, a RTA road traffic accident, a road traffic accident, whatever it was. Okay, so with that then, it seems like you've got plenty of data on this and I don't want to put you on the spot too much with it um because I know I've not I'm not giving you these questions ahead of time but have you done any experimentation with rather than just sending emails texting people or using cadences involved like LinkedIn or other formats or are you you happy that email is the best way to go about this no no we we do uh also support text messages uh some companies even auto dial to call to re to remind uh, we have not found that the auto dial adds anything, uh, but for for short text messages uh, are helpful in in some verticals. Um, for example, we found that text messages are most effective uh, when you have a meeting at, at a trade show, because people are not on their computer; uh, mm -hmm. they have their phone with them, and they may not check their email, but they check their their text messages. So <laughs> we have a trade show solution. This day is not very used, as you can imagine. <laughs> But but um, but it was in use. Um, text messages were the main uh, main uh, message. It's interesting because uh, <clears throat> at the trade show, it's very acceptable to send a text message. Uh, in in the regular world, um, especially in the enterprise world, uh, people feel that text messages are more personal, and they they uh, would not, would not want that. So it really depends on the the context and uh, and the industry. The same thing uh, that Weave and these other um, companies sending to medical text message is very uh, frequent. It's very well accepted, and uh, and I actually get text message confirmation from my dentist, for example. And and so it, it, you think it's only fair that I send him back a text message to say, "Hey, I'm a sales guy. I'm meeting you." But they're, they're in some verticals, they're very well accepted, and they work very well. In others, email uh, the preferred mode, and in many cases, it's a combination. So how much experimentation do we need to do, Nicholas, to get uh, to get the numbers that you're describing here? Are they the baseline numbers and then we experiment to improve them? Or do we start from a, a lower number and then it takes a, a bit of work to make this happen with, with the cadences and everything else? Yeah, no, that's a great, great question. There's, there's a, a quantic uh, jump. Uh, going from nothing to something, <clears throat> you're immediately going to improve a lot, right? And if you... Look, we have found that if you go with uh, my three three touch cadence, uh, you're going to vastly, you, at least you're going to uh, divide your notion by two, and then you can play uh, optimize. So then you can look into the content of the the reminders and and see what works better, and so on. But um, the optimization is is an ongoing process, right? You can you can. Uh, or is uh, do better, as I mentioned, when you go from 35% no-show to 10% no-show, you still have 10% no-show to, to work on. Um, but there's definitely a step function where you, you sure. can just improve by doing it. And I, you're almost taking the wind out of some of these questions, which clearly you thought about this, obviously the CEO company that is providing the service. So you've thought about this more than I have, uh, but you seem to have an but answer for everything I'm sharing. It, uh, it's not that I've thought about it, Will. It's, it's our business. So, so we, of we, course. We, you know, we have uh, millions of transactions every year, so we, we, we observe the data and uh, and we, we see what works and what doesn't, yeah. So, so let me turn this on its head slightly. What did you, um, whether this was when uh, you first started or whether it's new experiments that you're doing now, what did you try that you thought was going to be dead cert in speeding up this time from a buyer showing interest to a, speaking to a salesperson? What have you tried that you thought was going to work that just didn't, fit, didn't work at all? 
Um, yes, I have one. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we've. We've tried many things that haven't worked, but you were very specifically asking uh, what was tried around the, the speed to lead and, and uh, engagement. So we have um, <clears throat> tried uh, suggested time in mass. So the idea that you uh, take 300 contacts and you bombard them and say, three suggest here are three suggested times to book. And the reason we thought it would work is because, as I mentioned, when you were trying to catch up on one-on-one, -on -one, the suggested times convert like 11 times better. So we thought, oh, let's make it a scale, right? And send so you take all the public you've never talked to and say, here three suggested times. And it completely backfired. And our, our read on it is that uh, people have never heard of you, and if you send them suggested times, they perceive it as too aggressive. Sure. Right? It's like they perceive it as spam and, and like uh, say, who the hell are you and why would I book this three times? And um, retrospectively, I should have thought of it because uh, sometimes I get these, these messages mostly from uh, um, lead generation companies, you know, like uh, appointment setters, and say, and the title says, Nicholas, how about 2 p.m. on Thursday, right? And and they say, we are lead appointment setters. And I... I hate it. <laughs> I hate it. You know, it's like, <laughs> how about you go to hell? That's kind of thing, you know? <laughs> I don't know you. I have nothing. I hate yeah. it. How, how about you be a buddy? And I think our, our suggested times in in uh, in mass uh, got the similar um, uh, unpleasant reactions. You know, I don't know you. Uh, you, you 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 don't tell me uh, that you're going to meet tomorrow at three p.m. Um, uh, you have to do some work first. Yeah, well, this is all comes down to sales training from the 90s. This is why I started the podcast, Nicholas, of I logged on to YouTube, I tried to read books. This is like four, six, seven years ago now, and everything was, so that would be called an assumptive close. So you, you reach out to someone and you only give them two options, and the the psychology is that the, they have to choose yes. There's no no. But I think in the world that we live in now, it's too easy just to click like delete or just to hang up the phone. And I don't think, well, I've never experienced, when when this happens to me, I've never experienced any real uh, kind of like influence or social pressure to respond to these things. I just do what you do and just go, I'm not giving you permission for this. I'm I'm out of here. And, and you know the LinkedIn message gets deleted and I get rid of the person. I get most of these messages, as you're saying, from lead generation companies seemingly on LinkedIn. Yeah. What happened is that... Uh... You read that uh, something is a really good idea. So say uh, thought in your email, right? Like ask you, put, put the title of thought in email. And the truth that, so it starts working, but then people get used to it and, yeah. and, they, and they recognize that spam, right? So we, we, we pattern recognize. And, and then now that thing that used to work is now uh, recognizable spam and you delete it. So, so all these techniques have a short... Uh, Lifespan, you know, it, it, it works a little bit, and then and then and then we our brain starts to detect that it's something a trick that people use, and and you we put it straight to the trash can. Yeah, and and so, how much does permission come into this from the perspective of the inbound lead? And what I mean by this, uh, Nicholas, is have you done any experiments where you on the the form that they're filling in, you make them tick a box that they definitely want this meeting, or there's some kind of disclaimer of I, I'm kind of pushing it here slightly to exaggerate the point, but there's a disclaimer perhaps of we only allowed you to book the meeting once. If you don't show up, we can't book it again. Uh, how much of it come? How much of the success of the rest of this sales process comes down from the fact that the person who is doing the original outreach or the inbound lead is going, hey, I, I really do want this. Uh, I've never tried that experiment. It's a, it's an interesting thought, uh, but you know we in sales are always de desperate to get this meeting, so we don't want to discourage people, right? So you don't say, "Are you sure you want this meeting? <laughs> Check the box you're going to attend." Um, uh, so we 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 we've never run that that, that experiment. Um, <clears throat> we do qualification, so it's kind of a proxy with that. We we. Um, so typically, we, for, for example, um, some of our customers use lead scoring and they, they, pass, they pass the score of the lead in the form so that this data is actually, when it's submitted, our software takes into account. And, um, and if the score is not high enough, then 
the, uh, no meeting is booked. The idea is that you don't want to take the risk of a no-show or have somebody who is not really interested take the time of, of, a, of an account executive. Companies that do that have a lot of leads and few uh, few uh, actual conversions. For example, Twilio in this case, uh, everybody's experimenting, everybody's heard of Twilio, they go to Twilio's side, they say, I wonder what he does, and you're a student, you say, hey, I want to talk to them. You want to talk to them, but they don't want to talk to you. They want to talk to companies that <laughs> yeah, have a project and are going to deploy. And, and so they actually uh, use that that, that um, um, scoring in, in the thing. But I've never seen anything explicit where say uh, commit uh, sign with your blood that you're going to show up at the meeting <laughs> and, you, and that you're a real prospect. <laughs> otherwise, send us a blood sample. Otherwise, we won't take you. Uh, it's it's done in much more um, subtle method. Sure. I, I, the reason I ask is we do something on uh, when we get on group calls uh, with uh, a bunch of sales leaders who want to purchase our um, sales training program on a kind of team membership as opposed to individuals. We um, try and pre-frame the conversation of this is how the meeting will go, and we within the uh, the correspondence between the meeting being booked and then the, the date of the meeting, we'll essentially outline, it's all automated, but outline an agenda. And again, try and pre-frame that this is how things go. If it's a great fit for you and you, we choose that it's a good fit for us, then um, we'll work together and try and try and position ourselves as consultants and experts in the space rather than you're the one in power hounding a salesperson for a price and, you know, shifting those uh, those scales of power in the conversation and it, it's all very open and honest it's, it's not there's no manipulation or anything going on there it's just if you choose to work with us this is how we do things it just seems like something like that at the beginning of the sales process before the buyers even put up the hand could get rid of a, a load of no shows or could get rid of a load of people who are even just price shopping or, or something like that but obviously at the detriment then of someone going who might be a, a potential customer going i'm not i'm not agreeing to this nonsense before we even get into the conversation yeah, no, that, that, that's a great technique uh, or approach uh, um, to lead the pr prospect. It's a bit like when, you know, at the end of a sales call, you say, uh, put it in your own words. In your own words, uh, what, what is it that you see in, 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 sure. in my product that can help you? And by phrasing in their own words, they convince themselves, or at least they make it clear why they should do it and they feel more committed. And I can see how ahead of a meeting, you can say, hey, um, we're very busy. Uh, you sure you really want it? And then the person is going to think it through and, and get to a higher level of conviction that they really want that meeting with you, your uh, sales training. That's definitely a, a good approach. It seems that uh, it's not so, it's, it's something best done when you have an initial engagement. So that form has been submitted, the meeting has been booked, and there's a time to say, okay. So it's part, probably best part of that uh, three-touch uh, pre-meeting um, sequence that I mentioned, where you you the person has booked, and you, then you want to increase uh, the commitment. Um, but it makes a lot of sense that that approach to say, look, we busy, and um, and uh, make sure we're not for everybody, and we only for the best, you know. We all want what's not for everybody, right? Sure. And, and look, you've got to be clearly. You've got to be congruent with this. If you know, if I'm working, if I if I was advising Salesforce, clearly they've got a massive team. They can just they could throw as many leads at them as possible, and they'll absolutely crush it. Uh, versus us, where there's me and two other people, and the beat the the diary's booked too much, too full, regardless of whatever we do. It's just too much demand. Uh, so so just to kind of. Uh, uh, kind of add some context to that of we are genuinely that busy. That's why it's uh, yeah, no, yeah, exactly right. right. It's actually right. If Salesforce said we're too busy, we can't add another, <laughs> another client to our CRM. <laughs> Customers were really what's wrong with these people. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, so no, let, let's move on from uh, just the the uh, the automation at the beginning because I feel like you could give salespeople as many leads as they need, right? And everyone could show up. Is there anything that salespeople should be doing within the first? 10 seconds of that meeting based on everything we've talked about so far to make sure the meeting goes goes well? Or is there anything that you feel like could really scupper a, a sales meeting or a demo on the back of all this automation? Because clearly the buyer hasn't really even spoken to someone before the demo at this point. Is there anything that salespeople need to do to make sure that that demo goes effectively considering that perhaps that lack of engagement, uh, real-time engagement at the beginning of the process? I don't know about 10 seconds. Uh, I mean, there is this uh, 
since you're in the business of uh, sales training, there, there, there is this idea that uh, people make up their mind or get to an evaluation of you in the first 10 seconds. This book called The Way of the Wolf, I don't know if you uh, read that book where it says that the first second from the tone of voice, uh, the, the prospect will already make up their mind of what they think of you. So that, that, that tone of voice thing is definitely um, applies to that meeting. Uh, but I think you alluded to something uh, deeper, which is uh, um, the prospect came with some interest and what can you do to make sure that his interest is real? And uh, so not only how they perceive you, but also how, how to go about it. And what we do uh, at Chili Paper, we have a rule, which is, um, so all, all our meetings are on Zoom, which is always ask uh, the prospect to share their screen. Um, and the reason why we do that is because when it's a bit like what you were saying, like in your own words, uh, what is how would you what is the value? When you share your screen, you show your problem, you re-experience these problems. So you you uh, you can show. I'm going to show you. Let's say I'm going to show you my problem with uh, how we process inbound leads. Right? They share the screen. They show you the steps. They show you the queue. They see the queue with some leads that have been untouched for 48 hours. And it's in their face, right? The problem is in their face. So now we can talk uh, because they, they, uh, they've, uh, you've triggered the, uh, the emotion that got them to book in the first place. So that, that is a rule um, for all our demos. They always share the screen and show them, have them show the, the current process and the, and the problems so that you, you, uh, you reactivate that pain and, and you're in good situation to, to, to lead the meeting. So it's a bit uh, it's a bit deeper than ten seconds, but it, but it's, it's I think it alludes to what you're trying we're trying to talk about, which is they came, they have a problem, and how do you make sure that that this problem is confirmed? And that's how we do it. That makes total sense. And let me let me throw this at you then, Nicholas. So you you're perhaps selling, and perhaps it's a massive customer, so it's well worth uh, you being. I don't know if there is a customer big enough for you to be worth uh, being involved in the sales process. But let's imagine there is. What do you do when they turn around and say, "Sorry, I I, I don't want to turn my screen on." Uh, yeah, that happens. So uh, you have to be skillful in how you ask. Uh, but th th they do say that. So in that case, what we the second best proxy is to uh, um, have them experience the product one way or the other. So for example, um, when we when we mentioned our two core solution, the the inbound. Uh, so we say, okay, in that case, so why don't you come to our website and um, you tell me when you're on it, and you tell me when you submit the form, and and I'll, and so they actually experience the, our solution themselves. We don't see it because they don't share the screen, but they tell us over over the Zoom, and we know that they're doing. It. And the same thing with our suggested times. We say, okay, in that case, let me send you some suggested times. We send them and say, no, uh, you see them, yeah? Can you book book a meeting, yeah? And they experience it. So we don't manage to have them re-experience their pain, but we do manage to get them to at least experience the solution. So, which is, you know, there's more and more data, um, it's not data, research um, about how decisions are made. I mean, you're in that business, so so I'm sure you follow that as passionately as I do. And um, there was this big debate, or, uh, is it emotion, is it reason, how people make up their mind? And recently there was this book called The Enigma of Reasons, and uh, the idea that uh, the decision comes from uh, what he calls brain inference. So the brain infers something. And that comes from a trigger. So something triggers something. And the best way to get a trigger is an experience. It's not saying something. If I say, we suggested types will convert better, that, that triggers something abstract. If you send suggested time, they click the book, that triggers something much stronger. And I say, oh, wow, right? And it's, it's not, you can call it an emotion, but it's not an emotion, it's an experience that, that is going to uh, be processed by the brain as something much more um, significant than just a bunch of words. So you mentioned a couple of books there. You, I'm assuming you're an avid reader. I am. Is there any books that you'd recommend on um, and it doesn't have to be necessarily a sales book, like the book you just described was it was a, a bespoke sales book. Are there any books that you'd recommend on this process of uh, en enabling people to 
see a concept or better understand things or even books on on how to teach or how to explain or anything like that so the the book i mentioned is called the enigma of reason it's it's a a book by a evolutionary cognitive psychologist so <laughs> it's not exactly <laughs> your sales training training person uh there's another book that a, a very large book by Paul Glimcher on uh, neuroeconomics, uh, the neuroscience, and that. But these are a bit too um, abstract and theoretical for 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 this audience. Uh, the book that is a required reading for every newcomer at Chili Piper is um, "Never Split the Difference" uh, from Chris Voss, and that's because. Um, even though he, he was originally talking about negotiation, he, he, he proposes a lot of techniques that are very applicable in sales. Um, and, and you can, uh, you can uh, relate back to science. For, for, for example, he has a, a key concept in his book called tactical empathy, right? So he's um, Suggesting that you empathize, but you're not really empathizing. You're trying to understand the other prospect. And in in science, there's this uh, concept of theory of mind that sounds like empathy, but it's not empathy. It's the ability to to understand what's happening in the other's mind. And it's actually the same concept of tactical empathy, but they call it differently. And there's all sorts of research uh, supporting what Chris Foss says. So that's the book I would say uh, people ought to start with. Yeah, we've had Chris on the show a bunch of times now. I think he's. We've got one video on YouTube with like half a million views now. A lot of a lot of people listening to this probably came from that Chris Voss uh, interview. Uh, love it, great book. Is there any other must reads for even the executives, perhaps at uh, Chili Piper? So, with the way of the wolf is a, 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 another one that we have read uh, for, especially for newcomers. So, not so much for the executives. Um, the never split the difference is, is for account executives. Um, as for our executives, uh, I, I, there's no required reading. We have our own, uh, own rules and values, and I haven't found a book yet that, uh, that uh, encapsulates them. You know, I, I just posted uh, Chili Pepper is a distributed company. Uh, so we are now 65 people in 58 cities and 22 countries. And we have this big belief that we all brothers and sisters all over the world. And so our number one value is health. So I haven't found a book. I mean, there must be one somewhere <laughs> that, 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 that exemplify the, the, this philosophy. Uh, but for sure, when people come on board, uh, they, they can experience it. So that's how we, we, we convey our values at Chili Pepper. Sure. Is, is there any uh, values, and we'll wrap up with this, uh, is there any values at Chili Piper that might seem a little odd or that might seem, um, that might be misunderstood or from it's one outside looking in, is there anything that stands out as, oh, that one is particularly interesting because I think you know we can all take on board and, and comprehend this idea of we need to help each other. And there's, there's probably some, I'm sure there's, there's some cliche ones in there as well, but is there any that go, people look at and go, oh, I never really thought about that. that that's really valuable. So I don't think, the, the, a third value, uh, a four, we have four values. Uh, well, I put the, um, uh, help, innovate, take ownership. And the last one is have fun. So uh, I don't think people don't think about having fun, but they, Rarely think about having fun in the company value, yeah. right? Usually yeah. you have you, and uh, but we very much uh, look. The, the way I think of it is that uh, life is short, and uh, your job takes a lot of your time. And if you're not having fun in your job, you should move on something else. It's not worth it. So, so, uh, so we have the thing. For example, um, we don't have a goal on um, retention of our employees uh, because we think uh, look. We do our best for people to grow and have fun, but if we fail at it, then then, then uh, we're not going to try to get people to stick, you know, with vesting of options or anything like that. Everybody should uh, we should be free to do their own things. So that approach is a bit different from other companies, right? Uh, we uh, we just uh, let people have fun, and, and if they don't completely understand that, they they they, they are the places where they should. 
I think you're underselling that slightly. I've never heard that in uh, any, whether it be big business, small business, whatever it is. Have fun. It's uh, kind of integral, uh, right? We, if you're going to grow take, fast we, and, we, we and take, not we fight. Take it we take it seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you, this year we couldn't do it. But last year, uh, in September, um, we took the entire company to Ibiza to do the clothing of the Pasha Club. And wow. I have the photos with us with the don't pray in your magnums, you know, as we were, <laughs> we were having fun there. So we, we, we mean it, you know, we, we spend some money to, to make that value a reality. I love it. Well, with that, tell us more about Chili Piper and where we can find out more about you as well, Nicholas. Yeah, so Chili Piper, uh, you can come to our website. It's a play on world. So Chili uh, is C-H-I-L-I Piper. Uh, and you can engage with us using our own tools. And then about myself, uh, uh, something interesting to say that uh, late in life I um, discovered that I have ADHD. So you know, people call me lazy and all sorts of things, and now I, now I have an official excuse from the doctor <laughs> that I'm, <laughs> I'm not lazy and I have, I have ADHD. The reason why I didn't do the term paper you asked me to do is because mm. of ADHD. And so, as crazy as it sounds, uh, I started another company. It's called Cosmo Time. And it's to help people manage their time. So it's like a, because I, I was struggling with to-do list. I was writing all my tasks and never got them done because of ADHD. So I thought that's not working for me. So I have a, a new way to manage my tasks and my time where I, I schedule and block time in my calendar. I block distractions. And uh, so if you want to find out about uh, me and, and try that method, it's Cosmo Time. is K-O-S-M-O time.com. It's... Um, my secret uh, weapon to uh, get things done. Secret weapon, love it. Well, I'll link to that in the show notes to this episode. I'll link to Chili Piper and the books and everything else that we talked about as well. And that'll be over at salesman.org. And with that, Nicholas, I want to thank you for your time, your insights on this, mate. And I want to thank you again for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Thank you so much. It was uh, great fun to talk to you. (laughs) 